So today is um, our first session on Hadith studies. Today will be an introductory lesson. Before we even start with our lesson, we should be fixing our intention. We should be having the right intention that we are doing it for the sake of Allah to acquire his pleasure, to seek the knowledge of his deen, to practice it upon ourselves and preach it to the people. So this should be our intention. Rasulullah so, says in a Hadith, the acceptance of the actions are pending upon one's intention. So if you want, if you want your actions to be fruitful, your intention has to be right. <clears throat> so the importance, first slide, the importance of learning knowledge. Rasulullah says, Talabul Almi Faridatun ala kulli Muslim. Seeking knowledge is an obligation upon every believer. It's a hadith recorded by Ibn Majah in his Sunnah. So seeking knowledge is an obligation upon every believer. The way he's praying salah is an obligation. Um, fasting is an obligation. Similarly, the seeking of knowledge is also an obligation. Meaning if people do not acquire knowledge, they'll be sinful, they will be punished. Now, which fard is it referring to? Because there are two types of there are two types of fard, for the ayn and for the kifaya. So for the ayn is um, praying salah five times um, five times salah, um, charity for those people who are entitled whose um, wealth reaches nisab, fasting. So these are all for the ayn. Everyone has to do it. And for the ayn, for the kifaya means it's not. Compulsory upon everyone. If some people carry it out, it'll be dropped from the rest. So, which type of knowledge is Rasulullah sallam referring to? Which type of farz is Rasulullah sallam referring to? He's referring to every knowledge that is practice is compulsory. Is seeking is also compulsory. For example, knowing how to do wudu will be farz ain. Knowing how to take a, a farz um, shower will be farz ain. Knowing how to pray salah will be farzain. So it's depending on the practice. If the practice is farzain, the seek seeking its knowledge will also be farzain. And farza kifaya is, for example, attending the janaza prayer, um, burying the dead. These are all farza kifaya. Not everyone has to do it. If some people do it, it will be dropped from the rest. So it's all depending on the practice. <clears throat> now the obligation of seeking knowledge is indicated in the verse Surah Tawbah verse 122 A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Ar-Rajim Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Wa ma kana al-mu'minun al-yanfiru kaffa falawla nafra min kulli firqatin minhum ta'ifatu liyatafaqahu fi al-dini wal yungdhulu qawmahum idha raja'u ilayhim la'allahum yahdaroon The translation Allah Ta'ala says it is not necessary for the believers to march forth all at once only a party from each group should march forth leaving the rest to gain religious knowledge, then enlighten the people when they return. So this is a verse regarding um, the, the time, he refers, he referred to the time of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam regarding warfare. That Allah Ta'ala is saying, when it comes to warfare, not everyone have to march. When Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam remains behind, not everyone should go to the, not everyone should go to war. Some people should, remain behind with Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa so that whatever that will be revealed upon Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa the people who live uh, who remain behind can learn and when the people they come back from the from war they can learn from the people who remain behind so this is so what he's trying to say just as the way going to war jihad is obligation seeking of knowledge is also obligation the second hadith um, the heading, the importance of spreading the teachings of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Convey my teachings to the people even if we were a single sentence. Reported by Imam Bukhari in his Sahih. So, Ballighu Anni Wala Wala this is the hadith. Now, this hadith is a very important hadith and and it has um, <clears throat> it has a deep meaning, this hadith. So in this hadith, this is a very comprehensive hadith, very short but very comprehensive, and you know it has it has a detailed commentary. So Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is saying, convey my teaching to the people even if it were a single sentence. 
So what he means by single sentence, ayah, in the hadith, the, the word ayah is mentioned. So ayah refers to the Quran. Ayah means a verse of the Quran. So what he means is the minimum requirement for giving da'wah will be fulfilled. Even if it were to be a short hadith, the minimum requirement for giving da'wah will be fulfilled. For example, if you were to narrate the hadith, Man naja, you know, your obligation of giving da'wah will be fulfilled. So even though it's a very short, short hadith, even though it's a very short hadith, but the purpose has been fulfilled. Man naja, another hadith, Ad-Dinun Nasiha. So Rasulullah is encouraging us. However much knowledge we have, even if it may be, even, even if it may be very little, preach it to the people. Now there may be some questions you got to uh, wh why did Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa say ayah and why did you not say hadith? Why did you not say preach my hadith to the people? Uh, preach to the people uh, my teachings even if it may be a single hadith. The reason why he said ayah and not hadith is because uh, um, hadith will automatically come under this. Um, will automatically come under this ruling. Because the way is obligation um, to convey the teachings of the Quran similarly is an obligation to convey the teachings of Hadith. So by using one, it serves both, basically. Everything comes under the obligation of preaching. Allama ibn Tuibi, the commentator of Mishkat, he said, in this Hadith, there are two benefits. So one benefit is that it's encouraging the people to spread knowledge. The second benefit is um, he indicates towards the permissibility of narrating a part from a hadith, basically. You don't have to narrate a full hadith. You can, if you want, you can narrate a chunk of, um, you can narrate a part of a hadith. For example, there's so many hadiths, it's a long hadith, but you can, you are allowed to. Narrate a part of a hadith. You don't have to do full, provided that it is a complete sentence. Second slide, virtue and status of the scholars of hadith. Now, the scholars of hadith, they occupy a very high rank because they have the knowledge of the um, teachings of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They have knowledge of the sunnah. <clears throat> Wherever they practice will be in accordance to the sunnah, will be in accordance to the way of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because they have the material, they have the knowledge, they have the data. Now the first hadith, Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the person, the person closest to me on the day of judgment is the one who sent the most salutation upon me. This is a hadith in Tirmizi. Now the question is, who will be the closest person to Rasul Sallallahu on the day of judgment? So Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the hadith is saying, the person who sends the most salutation. Now the reason why this is relevant to the people, to the scholars of hadith is because they are the ones who send the most salutation upon Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now you may ask me how. It's because when you learn hadith or when you teach hadith, you have to also read the chain. So in the chain, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa name come. And when Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa name come, you will have to say sallallahu alayhi wa When you read or when you hear Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa name, it's wajib that you um, reply, you send salutation. So if, if anyone was to attend a hadith gathering, they will, they will come to realize that how many times the students of hadith, the teachers of hadith, they repeat the salutation upon Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And this is the day-to-day -day job. This is the duty. The entire, the whole entire life is dedicated in the teaching in the hadith of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So imagine how many times they are sending salutation upon Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So it's a very obvious, clear cut hadith that it is referring to. They are included in the virtue. The second hadith, Allah's Messenger of Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, May Allah enlighten a man who hears something from, from us and um, then he conveys it as he, as he had heard it. 
The third hadith, Allah's Messenger of Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, in every successive century, those who are reliable authorities will preserve this knowledge, rejecting the changes made by extremists, the plagiarism of those who make false claims for themselves and the interpretation of the ignorant. So this is a hadith in Mirqat al-Mafatih. So this is, um, this hadith is referring to um, the scholars of hadith. As we can, if those who, who are aware of history, the Islamic history, all the trials and tribulations the Ummah went through, um, the emergence of the deviant sects, um, who approached them, it was the scholars of Hadith. Whenever there was any um, deviant sects causing fitna, sp spreading the wrong ideologies, it was the scholars of Hadith who, who, who confronted them, who debated them, who defeated them, and who made sure and who clarified to the people that these are the wrong sects. For example, during the time of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, he was the one who confronted the Mu'tazila, the deviant sect. And he was a scholar of Hadith. He was the greatest scholar of Hadith of his time. So similarly, over the ages, um, this, this is the case, that whenever there's any fitna, um, any sectarian related, it was the scholars of Hadith who confronted, who confronted them. And we can also learn from this hadith that Allah Ta'ala chooses for every century, Allah Ta'ala chooses such people. There will be in every century, there'll be fitna. So Allah Ta'ala chooses, Allah Ta'ala selects, Allah Ta'ala prepares such people. And they are the people of hadith, scholars of hadith, muhaddisun. There is a hadith in Sahih Muslim from Anas that a person once came to Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he asked that when is the Last hour. Rasulullah sallallahu said, what type of preparation do you made for the, um, for the hour? So the man replied, listen to his reply, the love of Allah and his messenger. Then Rasulullah sallallahu said, that you will be with those who you, whom you love. So Anas ta'ala remarked that we became so happy that we never became happy like this after we accepted Islam. Because from this, they got the message. They came to know that those people who love Rasulullah they'll be raised with them on the day of judgment. So they became very happy. So Anas said, "Fana Allah wa Rasulahu wa Aba Bakrin wa Umar." So he, upon hearing the hadith, he said, "I love Allah and His Messenger and Abu Bakr and Umar radiAllahu taala anhuma, and I hope that I will be raised with them, even though I, I may not have committed." Um, Perform what they have performed. But I hope that I will be raised with them because of the hadith of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And the people of hadith are the ones who love Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam the most because they took upon themselves the pres preservation, preservation of his knowledge. Who strived, who went through so much difficulty just to preserve the knowledge of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam, just to preserve the sunnah. So they are the people because of, because of the extreme love for Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam. That's what drove them to take upon them the, the, the hadith of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So they are the ones who, are, who will be raised um, with the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the day of judgment because of the love. As it is um, clear in the hadith. Imam Shafi rahmatullah said, Ahlul hadith fi kulli zaman in kas sahaba fi zamanihim. Look at the statement of Imam Shafi Rahmatullah. He said, the scholars of Hadith in every time, they like the Sahaba of their time. Because the people of Hadith are the ones who are, who are, um, who are imitating the Sahaba. By hearing from Rasulullah Sallallahu practicing it upon it themselves, preaching it to the people. So he said, 
the people of scholars of hadith remind me of the sahaba they are like they are like the sahaba in every in every age there is a very beautiful poem um in in the elevating the status of the scholars of hadith ahlul hadith hum ahlun nabi wa illa yashabu nafsuhu anfasuhu sahibu so rasul sallallahu so in the, the the meaning of the um, poetic verse is the scholars of hadith are the people of the prophet even if they have not accompanied him even if they have not been um didn't get the opportunity to to accompany him but their breath accompanies them He, their breath accompanies Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So the Sahaba, they are Sahaba because they, you know, they accepted Islam. They've seen Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam. They accepted Islam in his hands. They were with him. But the scholars of Hadith, they have, they, they have not. They are not. For, um, they, even if they have not seen Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam, they are, they are narrating and they are reading his statements. So that similarity. Now the next slide: historical background to the development in the compilation of hadith. Now during Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam's time, when he came to writing hadith, he went, he went. through two phases two stages the prohibition period and the permission period so initially rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam um, didn't allow the sahaba to write from him write down from him anything other than the quran rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam said said in a hadith that do not write down anything from me and those of you who have written from me anything other than the quran then he should erase it in another narration from abu sa'id radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu that he said we tried to request the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to allow us to write but he refused now the reason why rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam initially didn't allow the companions his people to write from him it was be- it was because of the fear of the hadith text mixing with the text of the quran the hadith text the hadith mixing with the quran this is the reason why rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam He didn't allow his companions. Later on, when there was no fear of anything mixing, you know, Islam, the affairs of Islam settled. The the message reached everywhere. Everything was in a complete form. There was no fear. So Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam he allowed, he permitted his companions to write from him. There is a story of Ibn Umar radhiyallahu taala anhu that he said. I used to write down everything I used to hear from the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, intending to memorize them. Then the Quraysh stopped me from it. They said, "You write down everything you hear from the Messenger of Allah, while the Messenger of Allah is a human. He talk, he speaks in anger, and in when he's not angry. So thus, I refrain from writing for a while till I inform the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam about the situation." So he sallallahu alaihi wasallam pointed with his finger towards his mouth and said right by the one in whose hand is my soul nothing comes out from me except the truth. So this is a clear evidence that Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam during Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam's time there were companions who wrote hadith from Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam and obviously this is after the permission period when Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam allowed the companions. Now during Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam it was not a very common practice to um, write down hadith from Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam some companions after he was permitted you know on an individual basis they would write down hadith from Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam with the intention of memorizing it with the intention of preserving it and obviously it was uh, the number was less it was not widespread it was not a common practice so the sahaba who had compiled hadith during rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam's time the notable ones abdullah bin amr bin as radiyallahu ta'ala anhu ali radiyallahu ta'ala anhu anas radiyallahu ta'ala anhu abdullah bin abbas radiyallahu ta'ala anhu abdullah bin mas'ud radiyallahu ta'ala anhu 
and Jabir bin Ab Abdullah radiallahu ta'ala. So these are the companions who've um, gathered the sayings of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And obviously, it was not with the intention of, um, you know, it was, it was for preservation and it was not arranged. During Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's time, whatever was written, whatever was compiled, they were not arranged. It was scattered, basically, with the intention of preservation, with the intention of memorizing. Now, one of the students of Abu Huraira, his name is Hammam bin Munabbi, rahmatullah, he, he had a um, booklet, he had a compilation that, which he had heard from Abu Huraira. So he will, he will attend the gathering of gatherings of Abu Huraira and wherever he will hear, he will just note it down. The book is, his, his book is called Sahifa Hammam bin Munabbi. Now, during Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's time, as I've mentioned, it was not a common practice to compile the hadith of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Very few people, after they were permitted, they compiled. But it was not arranged. Now, in the second century, during the era of Abdullah, um, Umar bin Abdul Aziz, Rahmatullah, the, the Khalifa of Islam, the Grand son of Umar he had the concern that the hadith, the tradition of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam should be written, should be compiled for his preservation. It was his concern. So he is the, so he started um, instructing scholars to, you know, whatever they have, they should, they should compile it. It should be written because there's a fear that the knowledge could be lost. So he had a one of his um, amil, one of one of the people who he appointed um, as a qazi, as a judge in Medina. So he said to him, "Unzur ma kana min hadithi Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam faktubhu." So. Umar bin Abdul Aziz, Umar bin Abdul Aziz, he said to um, Abu Bakr bin Hazm that see what you find from the hadith of Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam and write it down. فَإِنِّي خِفْتُ دُرُوسَ الْعَلْمِ أَفْيَ the the circles of knowledge will um, will keys. But you have the ulama and the demise of the scholars. So wherever you have, note it down for its preservation. So. When he gave this instruction, the only people who came forward, those the, the, those, um, the person who was in the forefront was Imam Zuhri. Ibn Shihab as Zuhri was the one who came forward and he took upon himself the task of gathering the hadith of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, Ibn, Hisha, Ibn Shihab as Zuhri is one of the greatest scholars of hadith in Islam, was the greatest scholar of hadith in his time. Imam Malik, Imam Abu Hanifa, and many great scholars of hadith were his students. So he is the first person to compile the hadith of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam after the era of the Sahaba. And who played the role, the virtue of um, commissioning goes to Umar bin Abdul Aziz Rahmatullah. He, so he was just like his grandfather. The way Umar who was the mastermind behind the compilation of the Quran, the person who convinced Abu Bakr similarly his grandson, Umar bin Abdul Aziz is responsible for the compilation of Hadith. He was the one who encouraged and in instructed the scholars to do so. He even paid the money. The time that they will give, he even gave them money. This is how much concern he had. So, Ibn Shiyab Azuri is the first one to have written upon his um, instruction. Now, during that time, whatever that was compiled, it was all mixed. It was a mix between Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's hadith and the statements of the scholars. So it was not just exclusive to Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's tradition. It was mixed, basically. And they were not arranged again. They were all mixed. Hadith of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam 
and the narration of the Sahaba, it was all mixed and it was not arranged. Now the now those called, those who compiled hadith in Mecca, the were Ibn Juraj, Ibn Ishaq. So they were the two great scholars who um, compiled the hadith of Rasulullah Those who resided in Mecca, both were great scholars. Ibn Juraj is a, was a mufassir. He's the mufassir of Quran, which of a tafsir you open, you'll see his narration. Ibn Ishaq is the is the scholar of history. So most of the histories that we have available, it, it came through him. He was transmitted through Ibn Ishaq, one of the early historians. So they were the two scholars in Mecca who compiled hadith. In Medina, you had Sa'id bin Abi Aruba, or Rabi', um, Rabi', Imam Malik. So they, they, these are the people you had in Medina who compiled hadith. In Basra, Iraq, you had Hamad. In Kufa, you had Imam Sauri. In Sham, Sham is referring to Syria, modern day Syria, Jordan, Lebanon, Philistine. So in Sham, you had Imam Awza'i. And so this is how it became widespread. It became, it became a common practice for the scholars to compile hadith. And compilation of hadith reached its peak in the third century. So before that, compilation did take place. But in the third century, it was at its peak. It was during that time that, you know, the Siyasitta were compiled, Mustad Ahmad and all the other notable Hadith compilations. So it was in the third century. It was at its peak. When it was refined, in other words, everything was well arranged, categorized. Hadith was not mixed with the statements of the Sahaba. So it, you can say, you can call it the refined period, in other words. Next slide, historical background to the development in the compilation of Hadith, second century. So all this took place in the second century. The Imam Zuhri, you know, the, the early scholars um, who have compiled the names that I have mentioned, it was in the second century. And as I've told you, whatever that was compiled, it was it was it was not exclusive to the Rasul, hadith of Rasul, it was mixed. So in one hadith book, you'll find the hadith of Rasul as well as the statements of his companions. So the notable books that were compiled during that time is the Muatta, Muatta of Imam Malik, Musannaf of Imam Abdul Razak, Musannaf of Abu Bakr ibn Abu Shaiba. So these are the books that are avail available to us today. And these were the books that were compiled in the second century. Now, next slide, moving on to the glimpse into the different compilation of hadith. Now, obviously, every compilation is different. Um, there's each author, they had their own motives, own approach to broaden the benefit. All this was done to benefit the people, to make it unique and to benefit the people. Each has its own uniqueness, each has its own benefit. So. From the compilation of hadith, you have the Jawami compilation. So Jawami is the plural of Jamia. So what's the meaning? What's the definition? What type of compilation can uh, what, that can, comes under this Jawami are those that include eight chapters that cover eight topics, in other words, eight as aspects of deen. Aqaid, Aqida, law, warfare, Good morals and conducts, Quranic exegesis, fitan, trials and tribulation before the day of judgment, signs of the last hour, and virtues and status of the noble companions. So any book that contains, covers all these aspects will be called a jamia. It will be from the jawamia. So the most fam famous jamia is the jamia of Imam Bukhari, Sahih al-Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, and also jamia Tirmizi. So even though Jami Tirmizi is known as Sunan, but it is also a Jami, it could be called a Jami because it has all these eight, um, it covers all these eight topics. So it covers most of the aspects of Din, basically. Akida, everything, every aspect. So you have Sahih al-Bukhari, which is a Jami, Sahih Muslim, and also 
Jamia Tirmizi, which is most famously known as Sunan at Tirmizi. The reason why it's called Sunan at Tirmizi is because he pays a lot of in, in, um, attention on fiqh. You know, he deals with a lot of ahkamat, a lot of laws. He ha, he, um, he he collected um, his um, compilation contains a lot of hadith related to law. So this is the reason why um, it's also called Sunan. The second type of compilation, Sunan. So Sunan is that hadith compilation that is arranged according to the juristic format. I mean, it's, it's, it's arranged according to the fiqhi order. Like if you open any fiqh book, there'll be Kitab al-Tahara, Kitab al-Salah, so on and so forth. So if you open up any of the Sunan books, Sunan Tirmidhi, Sunan Abu Dawood, you'll see its arrangement. So the mo most famous Sunan, you have Sunan Abu Dawood, Tirmidhi, Nasai and Ibn Majah, and there are other Sunan as well. So these are the um, four Sunan from the Siyah Sitta, um, from the Siyah Sitta. The next um, type you have Musannaf. So Musannaf are the very, obviously I've mentioned the, the, the Musannaf that were compiled in the second century. So the Musannaf are the very early compilations, even before Sahih al-Bukhari, even before the Siyah Sitta. So Musannaf are, is that compilation that is arranged according to the juristic format and contains the tradition of the Prophet wasallam, the statements of the companions, the verdict of the Tabi'un and Tabi Tabi'un. So that's what a Musannaf is. And it's arranged. <coughs> so the most famous Musannaf compilation, um, uh, Mus Musannaf of Imam Abdul Razak and Abu Bakr ibn Abu Shaiba. So they, these are the two most famous Musannaf. And um, they are published and, you know, enormous, gigantic size. They contain 30 to 40,000 hadiths, each of them. Huge. Um, huge books. Yeah. Then you have the Masanid, Musnad. Masanid is the plural of Musnad. So Musnad are those compilations that are arranged according to the names of the companions of the Prophet And it's not according to chapters. So the Musnad compilation, they're not arranged according to chapters. They are arranged according to the names of the companions in the alphabetical order. So Musnad Ahmad is the most famous uh, Musnad. <clears throat> Next slide, Muatta. The Muatta is that compilation that is arranged according to the juristic format and contains narration attribu attributed to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, narrations attributed to his companions, narrations attributed to the Salaf as salih and the opinions of some scholars. So Muatta it is arranged according to the fiqhi order and it contains all types of narrations attributed to Rasul and attributed other than Rasul as well as having scholarly views. So, the, so one of the distinguishing features of Muatta, it also has scholarly views. Whichever Muatta you open, you'll see. After the hadith, there'll be views of the scholars who thinks what is, um, whose opinion. Um, opinion of um, this scholar regarding this matter, so there'll be a, uh, there'll be views. So this is one of the distinguishes. Sunan at Tirmizi also has scholarly views as well. So the most famous muatta is the muatta of Imam Malik. You also have the muatta of Imam Muhammad, one of the students of Imam Abu Hanifa, who directly heard the muatta from Imam Malik and he compiled it. Then you have the Mustadrak. Mustadrak are those compilations that contain hadith that are in accordance with the conditions laid by Imam Bukhari or Muslim, and they have not included them in the collection. So Mustadrak, author of Mustadrak is basically that person who compiled those hadith whose narrators 
fulfill the condition of the narrators of Imam Bukhari and Muslim. So the conditions that Imam Bukhari laid um, for his narrators in, in taking the hadith, you know, he will he will also have those hadith who fulfill the you know same condition. Except that these those hadiths have not been included by Imam Bukhari and Muslim. They have not included them. So this is the only difference. So Imam Hakim, the most famous mustadrak is the mustadrak of Imam Hakim. It's a very beneficial book. It's a huge book, has lo- thousands of hadiths, and his narrators fulfill the condition of the narrators of Imam Bukhari and Muslim. Obviously not all the hadiths in this book is sahih. Not, not all of the hadith is according to the condition of Imam Bukhari. There are some hadiths which do not fulfill that, the, um, these conditions. Then you have the Mu'jam. Mu'jam is that compilation of the hadith in it are arranged according to the names of the teachers of the author or according to the names of the companions in the alphabetical order. So next you have Mu'jam. So Mu'jam is basically arranged according to the names of the teachers, of the author basically, in the alphabetical order. Or some of the compilations may be arranged according to the name of the Sahaba in the alphabetical order. <coughs> so you have the most famous Mu'jam collection of um, Imam Abu Qasim al-Tabarani. <laughs> So he had three compilations. Two of them were arranged according to the names of his teachers and one was arranged according to the name of the companions. So Mu'ajam al-Awsat and Mu'ajam al-Saghira arranged according to the um, names of his teachers. And Mu'ajam al-Kabir is arranged according to the So Mu'jam al-Awsat, uh, Mu'jam al-Kabir is arranged according to the, um, the first collection is arranged according to the names of the companions, which is the Mu'jam al-Kabir. And the last two, Mu'jam al-Awsat and Mu'jam al-Saghira, arranged according to the names of the teachers of the author in the alphabetical order. We'll very quickly skim through the names of the scholars of hadith, the date of birth, and the place of origin. So just to get a glimpse of the geographical um, location, where, where they were based, where did they do the khidma of hadith, it's very, it'll be very, it's very interesting. So you had um, Imam Malik ibn Anas, the author of Muattam Imam Malik, he was born in Medina. Ahmed bin Muhammad bin Hanbal al-Shaybani, the author of Musnad, um, the author of Musnad, Musnad Ahmad, his place of birth was Baghdad. Imam Abdul Razak, the author of Musannaf, he was born in Yemen. Um, Sulaiman bin Dawud al-Tayalisi, he's another great scholar of Hadith, he also has a Musnad. He was born in Basra. Abu Bakr ibn Abu Shayba, he was born in Iraq, um, Kufa. Um, Ishaq bin Rahawai, he was born in Merv, Turkmenistan. Um, Imam Bukhari was born in Uzbekistan. Imam Abu Dawood was born in Sistan, Iran. Imam Muslim was born in Iran, um, Nishapur, Nishabur. Imam Tirmizi was born in Tirmiz in Uzbekistan. Imam Ibn Majah was born in Kazvin, Iran. Imam Nasai was born in Nisa. Turkmenistan. So is um, most of the scholars of hadith they came from the former Soviet Union region, you know, near Russia, that region. The former Soviet. So most of the scholars of hadith they came from this region, that part, um, Russia, Iran, that region. The next slide, Abdullah bin Abdul Rahman al Darimi. So he was from Samarkand, Uzbekistan again. Abu Ya'la al Mausili, 
he was born in Mausil, Iraq. Abu Bakr al-Bazzar, he was born in Basra, Iraq. Muhammad bin Isaac ibn Khuzayma, he was born in Nishabur, Iran. Abu Ja'far al-Tahawi, rahmatullah, he was born in Egypt. Sulaiman bin Ahmed al-Tabarani, he was born in Philistine. Um, Abu Hatim Muhammad bin Hibban al-Busti, he was born in Afghanistan. Imam Daraqutni, he was born in Baghdad, Iraq. Imam Hakim, the author of Mustadrak, he was born in Nishabur, Iran. Abu Bakr al-Bayhaqi, he was born in Khurasan, Iran. Next slide, Hadith terminologies. So since we will be studying Hadith, a lot of the terms um, I'm going to be using, um, so it's, it's good to know the terms. So you're familiar with the terms. When I mention this, when I use these Arabic phrases, you know what I'm talking about. So Asar, statement of the Sahaba. So when I say Asar, it refers to the statement of the Sahaba or statement of the Tabi'un as well. Du'aif is a weak hadith. A hadith that has been, is, um, narrator has been disparaged or the chain is broken. Hadith is a statement of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa Statement, action, silent approval of physical de description that is attributed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa This is hadith. Hassan hadith is a sound hadith, which is a rank lower than Sahih. Hafiz, these are the titles given to the scholars of hadith. So Hafiz is a, who has a, he occupies a very high rank in hadith. Khabar and hadith, they, they mean the same. Its usage is very flexible. It could be, it could refer to Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam. When khabar is mentioned, it, it could refer to Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam. It could refer to anyone other than Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Marfu, a statement, action, silent approval of physical description that is attributed to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So marfu is that which is attributed to Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa by a sahabi or anyone other than a sahabi. Mawkuf is a statement, action or silent approval that is attributed to a sahabi. Irregardless of whether the chain is continuous or broken. Maktu a statement or action that is attributed to a tabi or anyone other than a tabi irregardless of the, whether the chain is continuous or broken. Matan means um, the text of a hadith, muhaddis, everyone knows where muhaddis is, expert scholar in hadith. Muttafakun alayhi means that hadith which has been included by Imam Bukhari and Muslim in their collection. Maudu is a fabricated narration that has been falsely attributed to Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Pardon. <clears throat> Rawi is a narrator of hadith. Rijal are the chains of narrators. Chains, um, the narrators in the chain. They are Rijal. Rijal is the ruler of Rajul, means a person. Sunnah is same as Hadith. A statement, action, silent, silent approval of physical de description that is attributed to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. After his prophethood and before his prophethood. So this is the difference. So Hadith is after his prophethood and sunnah is before his prophethood and after his prophethood anything that has been attributed to him sanad is a chain of a hadith so the chain of the hadith you will call it sanad sahih is that hadith which um which has um, um is that hadith is cha chain is continuous whose narration narrators are trustworthy and possess good position, the narration does not contradict with another narration which is more stronger and is free from hidden defects. So it fulfills all the conditions, requirements of a hadith being sahih. Sahihain, he refers to Sahih al-Bukhari and Muslim. Siyasitta refers to the six books of hadith. Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Dawud, Tirmizi, Nasai and Ibn Majah. Sunan al-Arba, he refers to the four Sunan, the Sunan of Imam Abu Dawood, 
Tirmizi, Nasai, and Ibn Majah. Shaykhain refers to Imam Bukhari and Muslim. So whenever in hadith, in any hadith lectures, Shaykhain is mentioned, he will refer to Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim. So today we'll be finishing our lesson here. We'll leave it till here. Next week we will resume from um, glimpse into the 40 hadith compilation. So from next week, inshallah, next week we'll be discussing everything revolving around the 40 hadith compilation, its history, the 40 hadith of Imam Nawawi will also disc um, um, mention will go over his biography as well. Then we'll start this going over the selected hadith. The hadith that I have select, I will be in every lesson I'll be selecting hadith. We're not going to do all the 40 hadith. I'll select from each chapter wherever I think will be um will be appropriate inshallah. If anyone has any questions you can ask on the group the WhatsApp group that has been created you can ask all the questions there. And during the lesson, if you have any questions, you can um, ask in the um, chat option, inshallah. And I will, in the lesson, I will be answering, inshallah. If not, I'll be meant, um, answering in the group. May Allah accept our, um, our gathering, our, our lesson. May Allah give us the tawfiq to benefit from this gathering, to practice upon whatever we heard and preach it to the people. Subhanallah, bihamdi, subhanak.